Good morning. In this video, we're going to be looking at over collateralized lending, and in particular, the blend protocol on Stellar. We're going to start by looking at how over collateralized lending works. Then we're going to go through the user interface and do some deposits and take out some loans using the testnet. And then finally, we're going to dive into the smart contracts and see how, as developers, we can build on top of these contracts to provide useful services, building on the Lego bricks of DeFi. Over collateralized lending is widely used throughout DeFi where we don't have things like credit histories to provide people with actual credit ratings or to do risk assessments. So a user will have to deposit more funds than they're actually taking a loan out for. This is still useful and we'll get into some use cases in a second, but how this works is you'd have a smart contract which acts as like a, a pool of different assets. We'll imagine this smart contract holds token A and token B. A user can deposit say a thousand dollars worth of token A into that contract and they can take out maybe up to 80% of a loan against that value. So if token A is worth $1,000, then they can take out a loan up to $800. Now often these two assets won't be directly pegged, so the exchange rate between the two and the valuations of them is fluctuating all the time. The pricing information is updated by an Oracle service, so an Oracle will go out and get the valuations of these from like centralized exchanges and places like that, and it will update the value of them digital assets into the smart contract. And that will provide us with a loan to value. So in this example we just looked at, the loan to value ratio will be 0.8 or 80%. Now a user can pay back this loan at any time. They simply pay back token B, and then they can take their original collateral out in token A. What can also happen is if token A depreciates in value, then that LTV ratio can get up higher and higher, closer to 100%, where the loan is of equal weight. Before that happens, a third party liquidator will be authorized by the smart contract, the code within the smart contract to go in and liquidate the position. They'll take the collateral and earn a small fee for selling that collateral off to kind of wipe out the loan, if you like, and that keeps the pool healthy. So why would anyone want to take out a loan for less than the value of the assets they're holding? Now let's talk about some use cases for over collateralized lending pools in DeFi. So the first use case is widely used, it's kind of used within yield farming and DeFi strategies, and that's leveraging up a position. You can deposit a native asset, you can take out a stable Lopcoin loan, and then use them stable coins to buy more of the native asset. This creates leverage in the system. If the asset drops in price, you can get liquidated and lose everything. It's not something that I would encourage people to take on lightly, but it is a widely used case for over collateralized lending pools. Another trading strategy that utilizes this is short selling. So a user can deposit a stable coin and take out a loan of a native asset. They can then sell off that native asset for stable coins, hoping to buy it back at a lower price later and realize a profit. This means they are short the position or they think that that asset is gonna go down in value and they're making a bet that it will. Some decentralized stable coins use a system like this for issuance. So they'll have a lending pool which kind of users can deposit native assets into and that authorizes them to mint a stable coin which is pegged to a certain asset, normally the US dollar. And finally, another reason why someone might use a decentralized lending protocol is to deposit native funds, kind of carry that exposure to those native funds while borrowing stable coins to use for living expenses. There's a number of reasons to do this. One is that in some jurisdictions there might be tax benefits. You're not kind of having a, establishing a taxable event by selling them tokens. So you're, you can save on capital's gain tax in certain jurisdictions. You'd need to check with your local jurisdiction there. And also it means that you still got that exposure to the native asset. If it trebles in value, you can simply kind of pay back a, the, the small amount of stable coins relative to the native asset. And if it doesn't, if it drops in value, you get liquidated and you still have the stable coins which you are using to pay for your living expenses. There's an opportunity cost here because whatever the LTV is, you're actually losing that percentage, which you can maybe only take out 80% of the loan. So you can be kind of it would be you'd be getting back 20% less stable coins than if you sold them directly on exchange. In the past, some blockchain developers and founders have used this method to realize gains on their token holdings of a project that they're in control of. They can take out a loan against the value of them holdings without actually kind of seeing them tokens end up on exchange and create a negative price impact. So the website for this is at blend.capital. We can go in, we have um, try blend on testnet, blend documentation, explore some of the blend repositories, it's all open source code, and there's a community on Discord. Let's dive into the testnet. Let's connect the wallet. I'm using the Expo wallet here. Accept the connection. 
If you don't have Wallet set up for this already, you can go into wallet.export.app and you can create an account as an option to generate wallet uh, from scratch or import using a secret key or mnemonic. And once we've connected that, we can go and look at some of these pools. So I'm gonna look at this USD XLM pool here. Let's open up the dashboard and we can see we've got the XLM asset here. It's got a collateral factor of 85%. So I have 9896. When you set up a wallet on a testnet, it automatically gets funded in most cases. If not, there's a link here, which you can paste your address on at the bottom and that will automatically fund your wallet for you with some XLM. Let's go ahead and supply 100 XLM. We're gonna get prompted by the Expo wallet to confirm that transaction. And that's gone through successfully. And you can see here, we've got your supply positions, XLM 100. We can withdraw those funds at any time, but what we wanna do is actually borrow some funds against it. So we're gonna be borrowing USDC, which is a stable coin on Stellar. And the most we can borrow here is $16 worth. So we just posited $20 worth of XLM. This is, this is testnet prices, these aren't accurate. And we can borrow $16 worth of stable coins, which is pegged to the US dollar. I want a collateralization ratio less than that, so I'm gonna borrow $10 worth of stable coins. Again, we have to sign a transaction. That'll get submitted to the network. You can see here we've got our borrowed position set up. We've borrowed USDC against our XLM collateral. Now, if you wanna get those funds back at any time, we can repay that transaction. And once that's gone through, we can withdraw the XLM deposit. And there we go. We've deposited assets to the protocol. We've taken out a loan in stable coins. We've paid the loan back and we've withdrawn our collateral. Now let's have a look at how you can do this programmatically so that blockchain developers can integrate this into the decentralized applications. So to find the contract addresses, I'm gonna go into the documentation. You've got some really nice documentation here. I'm going to zoom in on this. And we can go into deployments. This is the mainnet contract addresses. And we're looking for the testnet contract addresses, which are here. And you can see we've got some pools here. We've got an XLM USDC pool. We can copy this. Let's paste this into a block explorer. Switch this to testnet. And you can see the transactions going through here, including some of these which may well have been me. If we go into interface now, you can see we've got a list of functions. These are functions we can call from an external contract. It's like set admin, initialize, these are admin functions, so we wouldn't have the privileges to do that. But this submit function here is how we call requests and how we deposit funds and set up loans and things like that using the protocol. You can see this takes three addresses and a request vector and it outputs a position. These are custom types specific to these contracts. If we scroll down, we'll find these two. Here we have the request structure. This takes an address, an integer, and an unsigned integer as the request type. This is a, a code for what you want to actually do. And it outputs a position, which is collateral map, liabilities map, and a supply map. And if we go back to the transactions, we can see some of these going through. Let me zoom in. We've got the three addresses. And then we've got this vector here, which is set up with the address, the amount, and the request type. If we expand that transaction, we can actually see the funds moving about. So this was when we withdrew the credit back to our account, the XLM. And you can see that it's being debited from this contract address and uh, credited back to my personal wallet. Now let's take a look at a Soroban smart contract, which we could use to interact with this protocol. Let's dive into some Soroban code. So if we go into the Blend Capital GitHub repository, there's the Blend Contracts. Within that, we have a directory called test suites, tests, and we can open this test wasm happy path. Okay, so if we scroll down here, we can see we've got a standard unit test for a Soroban contract. And this is a great example of how we can interact with the protocol from a, a separate contract, if you like. So we're setting up a couple of addresses here for Sam and Mary. We're then setting up two tokens for a stable coin and the XLM native token. We're creating mutable balances, and then we're minting the token balances to these users. Obviously, this is in a test environment. 
Once we've done that, we can take the stable pool balance. We can set all the balances to zero. Then we have this pool.submit function. This is the function we looked at earlier in the block explorer. We pass in three different references to the address. So Mary, Mary, Mary. Then we create this vector, which passes in the um, a reference to the environmental variable, which is the Soroban environment, the blockchain environment. And then this request custom data type. The request custom data type includes three different fields. We've got the request type, which is the unsigned integer, it's kind of stating what we want to do. Then passing in the address. In this case, we're passing in the address of a token contract, a stable coin, and the amount that we want to supply. We're calling this function on the external contract. So we're supplying tokens to the external contract from within Soroban. If we scroll down to line 138, we can see an example of using the same function as pull submit function, but this time Mary's gonna be borrowing against her collateral. So she's passing a different request type or a different number to represent that request type. She's passing in the XLM address this time. So she's borrowing XLM against the stable coin. So we're calling this function from the external blend capital contract. What it means is that as developers, we can kind of build on top of other people's work and pull different things from the DeFi ecosystem together to build on the Lego bricks of DeFi and create interesting products using all the kind of DeFi primitives and products that are already out there. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you're in London around the 12th of October, then why not join us at the EZA by Stella Hackathon? It's free to register and there's some great prizes up for grabs. I'll put a link down below if you want to join myself and other developers building on the Stellar blockchain.